are we are recording, right? We are as of now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. We made it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, let's see. There's two more waiting. One more. All right, welcome everybody. Um, just before we get started, if everybody except for our special guests could mute your Zoom. It's the little microphone and it says mute under it. As much as I love listening to your children and um, we're gonna start off with about a 30 minute session with our special guest. We're gonna do a discussion. Rich, nice beard there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll have some time for some, some questions at the end. You can answer, you can ask your question by hitting the little more button wherever it is on your, whether you're using a laptop or an iPad or a cell phone, it's the three dots, hit more, and there's a little chat feature. This is being recorded, so um, it will be put on uh, the Facebook page later. So I first want to start off by introducing the two people that will speak, be speaking with us today. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Allison Del Zappo. I'm chair of Howard County Association's Legislative Committee. Um, I am wearing pants today. I know that was gonna be a big thing. And this is live. There is no 15 second delay, so I will watch my language. Um, we have Lisa May, who is our Government Affairs Director. Hi, Just everyone. So, you, so, those who don't, uh, so those who don't know what Lisa does, um, Lisa is part of our staff. She reviews every single bill that's either filed or pre-filed. She talks to legislators. She writes all of the letters of opinions from, that are guided by the HCAR board and the legislative committee. She attends every uh, hearing. Um, so she spends a lot of time. And she's probably really thankful that the baseball season's been canceled because she's really busy with everything else that's been going on legislative-wise, right? <laughs> Something like that, so yeah. Kind of, yeah. Kind of a blur uh, there. And then uh, our other special guest is Senator Guy Gazzoni. He is a Maryland State Senator representing District 13 in Howard County. He was a former delegate and he also served on the County Council before that. He is also chair of the 2020 Budget Taxation Committee. Um, so let's start off. And Guy, Senator, do you want to walk us through the last uh, days of session that kind of got cut early? Sure, um, but let me uh, first say hi to my boss, Susie. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> um, Sorry, I should have also met a realtor member. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so uh, let me actually just start a little bit before that um, and at the beginning of the session because we went into it believing that it was um, pretty different than anything we've done before because you all, their, the leadership had completely changed. A new Senate president, new Speaker of the House, and everybody was wondering what it's going to be. This is going to be an interesting session, and uh, we hear it's going to be an interesting session every year, um, but I knew that this one was going to be uh, more interesting, and then it really got crazy, of course. Um, <laughs> so in the last... Um, few uh, days of the session, um, we were trying to uh, get out the things that really mattered um, the most. And, you know, that's always an interesting question because everybody's got a different opinion of what matters most. We um, obviously had to pass the budget. That's our primary responsibility. We have to pass a balanced budget every year. Uh, a lot of folks uh, were very invested um, in uh, the Kerwin legislation. So uh, I believe that that was really a critical component of moving forward. And actually, while we're on that for a second, I, I need to, um, I know a lot of people have, um, I guess, questions about funding this big program. And um, I, I wanna let folks know that we never expected to move with this program if um, the resources weren't there. So, in fact, we put in um, checkpoints along the way, one every year and then one big one um, a couple years out. Um, the ones every year basically say if the money isn't there, 
uh, you can't move forward. You do what you were doing. What we were doing was essentially the rate of inflation um, for increased educational spending. So people have questioned and wondered, well, will the governor veto this? What will happen? And the answer probably is, um, you know, on some levels, it may not matter a great deal. Um, because if the governor didn't veto it, um, this checkpoint would take over and um, it would bring back um, uh, us to sort of an original funding place that we've been funding education all along on. So um, if he does veto it, the part that kind of does matter is that there's a lot of policy in this bill um, and a lot of way of thinking about um, how we should do a better job educating our kids because the reality is that uh, in Maryland, in the United States, we have fallen back uh, significantly in how do we make those improvements. And if anybody wants to talk about that, I could talk about it for quite some time, but uh, <laughs> I should move on. Some interesting things also that needed to get done, and I think are probably the most important um, uh, budgetarily, is um, one, uh, the capital budget. Um, and I believe that that needs to move forward. I hope the governor, the governor has until um, May 6th to decide whether to um, veto, um, allow bills just to become law um, uh, or sign them. And I don't think he's gonna sign anymore, but he can allow things to move forward. One of the things I hope he leaves to move forward is the capital budget itself um, and also um, HB1, which has to do with a, a huge, huge increase in um, uh, capital spending um, for education. And this, I think, is particularly of interest for all of us um, as we have um, gone through the whole redistricting discussion. Are the schools overcrowded? How do we handle the overcrowding issues? Um, just sort of framework block. Howard County usually gets from the state somewhere as low as six or seven million dollars in capital funding up to um, probably around 20-ish um, on any given year. This bill in and of itself, and, and fortunately I think um, I was able to make some a number of adjustments to it um, um, given sort of where I am in, in the legislature now with the, with the capital budget and with the budget overall. Um, we will get $125 million. Um, that, um, and the reason that, um, and it's different than in the past, is the way in which we're, we're using um, bonding um, to make this happen. And um, so it's, it's a great program. It, it, to me, not only is it about the schools and dealing with all those issues about overcrowding and such, but um, these are jobs, obviously, and as we come out of all of this with, um, with the economy, um, both this bill and the overall capital budget, there's a lot of projects in there that are going to generate a ton of jobs, and um, uh, I personally think that's um, uh, really important. So um, the other uh, budgetary thing that we did at the very end was we basically gave the governor um, sort of additional authority or outright authority to tap into our rainy day fund. Um, to the, we did it twice actually as we moved to the end as we were seeing things progress and seeing how things were going to be challenging. Um, the first time we did it um, was for $50 million uh, and then it was for $100 million. Um, he has already um, tapped in, if you will, or indicated he's going to use that money from the rainy day fund. Um, I guess I'll kind of leave it there because I could go on for quite a while. I don't know if we have quite a while, but. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that covers a lot. So what kind of, I mean, I guess you kind of touched on it already about, um, you know, Hogan maybe halting some spending. So you've already touched on HB1 and your concerns about if that doesn't move forward. Um, any other challenges or repercussions for the state? Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah, huge is, is the, the simple answer. Um, so um, let's see how I can lay it out. Um, so right now, to the best of our knowledge, um, he's, he's pretty much committed about, let's just say $400 million um, in additional spending to deal with um, the crisis. 
Um, and sort of the good news from the federal government is that we got a total of uh, nearly $5 billion to the state of Maryland uh, for uh, COVID relief. Now, only, um, uh, only uh, <laughs> of that $5 billion, uh, uh, $1.3 billion is to the state to be used in a flexible sense. So in other words, all that money um, that is being spent already um, is uh, at least at this point covered, if you will, um, that uh, 400 million, or, and we don't know where things are gonna go, obviously. There's costs with the tracing, there's costs with increased testing, all of those things. Um, but at the moment, what the federal government has um, come up with is actually pretty darn useful in covering those costs. What it won't do, though, is backfill loss in revenue. And that's where our big problem is going to be as we move forward. So um, if the expectation because of lost sales tax revenue, the expectation because of uh, lower withholdings, um, is that um, we may, in this year, this fiscal year, which ends uh, July 1st, or, or June 30th, um, it's gonna, we're gonna be short about uh, $2 billion. And um, in a general fund budget, um, uh, in, in the you know, 18 billion range, it's a significant chunk. I mean, it's big money. Um, it's no fooling around. How that's going to be covered just to get us through this year that ends right now um, is up to the governor, and he's going to be figuring that out. And so part of it will be that he'll be tapping into our rainy day fund. And that rainy day fund is somewhere in the order of about uh, $1.1, $1.2 billion. But obviously that doesn't cover it all. So the end, the, just to get through this year, um, he's going to have to make cuts. And um, he has the authority to do that through the Board of Public Works. They can cut up to 25% while we're not in session. Um, they, he has the authority, they have the authority to cut up to 25% of any program other than education. Um, and um, I, he's going to have to do it. He's going to have to do it to a certain degree. We don't know what his choices will be, obviously. Um, but he's going to sit down and make those uh, tough decisions um, to fill up whatever the gap is. And then... Um, uh, thinking about what will be the next year in July 1, he's, he's going to have a whole other series of concerns depending on how long this goes on. And of course, none of us know. The economists don't know. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, the health folks don't know. So what we're trying to do and, and, and what we do uh, from my committee standpoint and from the staff that we have in the Department of Legislative Services is try to sort of map out various possibilities and how bad it could be. What happens if we open up, but only partially open up? What if we open up fully? What if we open up and we have to close back down again? All of those things and trying to figure out the significance of this. Um, and it's, um, it's a big deal. Um, and as we move forward, there are gonna be substantial uh, cuts um, and there will, in my opinion, not be any increases, if you will, in sort of new ideas and new programs, like I was mentioning with Kerwin, um, just because the money isn't there. And we essentially set up the system to um, guard against, if you will, spending money that we didn't have. Now he's going to have to figure out ways under these sort of, uh, in this extraordinary circumstances, to actually figure out ways um, to make um, additional cuts. And it could be all across the budget, um, you know, whether it's the environment, could be in uh, uh, um, uh, I, the thing I worry about most because I work I deal with it most is me mental health and disability issues. Um, it, it's possible. Um, that's where the money is. Um, so um, the, the, you know the expectation is that, that, that it could come there. Um, very very troubling as we think about everything yeah. going on around. Us. Well, and that's, and that's interesting. I mean, I know we're a real estate industry, but just touching on the mental health aspect of it, uh, I mean, would you think that would be a viable cut considering all the mental health issues that could arise from just such a drastic change in everybody's 
life financially, mentally, all of that. So um, it's one of the things that I've worked to protect the most and have for a number of years. Uh, uh, I had a bill in a couple of years ago, which was the largest funding bill for mental health. It's called Keep the Door Open. Uh, it was basically to keep the door open to all of our community providers um, so that people could get to them. Um, and they're completely underfunded now. Um, we've done a really poor job over the years um, with this area. And it's one of the wrong reasons that I've taken a particular interest in it. So the answer is, um, uh, I hope not. Um, but uh, I, I'm also a realist um, and, and uh, somebody who spends a lot of time with the numbers to know that um, a lot of places within the budget are going to have to receive some reduction. I really hope it's not, but um, you know, it, it will be at, at least at this point in time until we go back into session uh, the, in the governor's hands and then the Board of Public Works. Okay. Um, and just touching on that some more, I mean, you went over some of the short term, you know, the next year or so impacts. What do you see this pandemic? I mean, I know it's hard to predict numbers and all that, but where do you honestly see um, the long term impacts of this on Maryland as a state? Hard to say. I mean, it really is. Um, it, the, the numbers are huge. I mean, if you, if you go to worst case scenarios, um, uh, but we're not alone, of course, in, in the country and in the world. Um, but um, we are certainly going to have to think about um, business differently, um, individually and as um, a government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, I mean, going through this, I mean, I know it's, um, it's always easy to dwell on, you know, the negative or fear the, the future. Just personally or professionally, have you seen any positives come out of this kind of experience? Um, I mean, I know personally, I've probably connected with more of my friends. I've been able to connect with more of my friends and family on a more regular basis. Um, but, you know, how about you? Hmm. Um, well, um, we were joking before everybody got on the call. Um, there are a few companies that are doing well, like the Zoom. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, the, the beautiful thing about, um, humans and human nature is that we tend to evolve, uh, well, and we tend to, uh, live up to the challenges. I believe we will. So I haven't lost that sort of sense of it. We will, uh, new industry will develop new ways of, um, doing business and, and thinking about things. And I guess if there is a, uh, a bright side to all of that is that, um, as we are sheltered in place, um, we're spending a lot of time thinking about what the future looks like and um, how we can um, best work in that future. Uh, whether it eventually goes back completely to normal or not, um, that process of having that thought process, uh, I think is, is good and useful. And I know that it's been good for me. Um, you know, I actually, you know, I've been doing budgeting um, for a long time, and ever since I was in the legislature for the last 14 years, I've been on a budget committee, but I am learning more and more every day, um, things that I either forgot or didn't realize the significance of some of the changes that we made and thinking about ways to make things better. So um, hopefully we're, we're all doing that. Yeah, and you're not, you're not necessarily new to, to this or to a crisis really. I mean, you started in the legislature in 2007, right before the recession. Um, so, you know, from that experience, positive, negative, whatever it might be, where, do, how do you think Maryland and we as people differ today during this pandemic than from 2008? I mean, obviously there are very different scenarios that created the economic situation that we're in. Um, uh, the, and actually right after um, we, um, uh, after the quote, Great Recession, um, there was a study done in our, uh, by our Department of Legislative Services about um, revenue volatility and how we look at the economy and how do we plan for changes. Um, and 
So some of the lessons that were there are lessons that we might be able to carry over in sort of a normal recession, if you will, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or, or something more normal. This is just such an extraordinary experience. I, I mean, there's no question um, and uh, no one was really ready for this. Um, and, and it's a whole new way of trying to think, mostly because of the spike um, and this dramatic shutdown of things. We've never seen anything like that. Um, you know, over the course of the time um, uh, of the last, uh, the Great Recession, um, we have more unemployment now uh, in, in a couple months than we did over the course of, of that time. So it's a different, it's a whole different um, way of thinking about what might or could happen. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, let me see if, if anybody has any questions, do not unmute yourself, but there's a little chat feature up in the right corner. Um, let me see if anybody, Susie's getting three weeks to the gallon um, on her car. Uh, so that's good. That's positive, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, well, so Lisa May, and we were kind of talking about this before. Okay, so Susie has a question. She would like to know, how can we as realtors help you guys uh, in Annapolis and, and what you're doing mm. or will be doing? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a real question. Let me just say just sort of we're in a unique place right now as a, um, as a part-time legislature. And I think people don't realize that, how significant that is. Um, it really is uh, what, what happens next is in the governor's hands um, and in, in the Board of Public Works' hands. So, um, you know, to the degree that you can help with all the things that um, the administration is asking for right now, um, and, and obviously I, I know all of that is occurring in many ways. In other words, I know just from um, being a realtor the things that um, the industry is doing to ensure um, the safety of clients and, and agents and, and so forth and buyer, you know, buyers and sellers. So, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of the basics. I mean, I know all of us are contributing in different ways when we can. I know people are making masks. I know people who are delivering food to hospitals and all of those things. I mean, I, I don't know that there is a specific thing. We're, we're just all in this together. I don't know that being a realtor specifically, other than making sure our industry is as safe as possible, um, that we can do. Um, uh, I, I think that's that's kind of the answer. Okay. Yeah. I um again, we appreciate your time, and you know, thank you for spending this this morning with us. Um, and so, I mean, the the short, long and short of it is basically, we've been through this before in a sense, uh, a crisis, very different, and it's really hard to predict what will happen. And essentially, nothing's off the table. In, in it in regards to anything and we just have to kind of get through it so if you have any last minute things you want to say um you're welcome well it's funny it's funny when you just repeated it that way i thought well maybe you didn't even need me to come here today um <laughs> no i think it is no, 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 I, I'm, it, I'm, I, no, it, it, look it's right you're right um but but this is you know one of the things that i'm spending a lot of time on is talking to budget people talking to um, there's a, the, the rating agencies have their own analytics companies. Moody's Analytics is one that we um, deal with a lot. Um, the New York rating agencies, how they rate all the governments and their bond ratings and such. And um, we just spend a tremendous amount, of, I have been spending a tremendous amount of time sifting through all this, um, looking at, you know, the impact of the, the lost revenues from the casinos. I mean, there are just so many different components to this. And at the end of the day, we don't know unless, uh, we don't know because we don't know how long this is gonna last. And that's probably, and, and, I, and that leads to sort of your point, um, which is, I think, right on. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate it. You're always, even outside of craziness, you're always available to talk with us and um, always reach out to us if you guys need anything or if you have a question about anything. Um, Guys, this Zoom is not over. We are going to get into the nitty gritty of Howard County and your tax increased questions that I see popping up. Um, so uh, 
Guy, you're welcome to stay on and watch the uh, tomato throwing and all that. Um, <laughs> So, well, I, I actually, it, I, it, as much as exciting as that sounds, um, I do have another call to get on. Um, so you I will you're be doing that. Working, guy. Yes. I, on, on behalf of H Car, we just want to thank you again for joining. Thank you for uh, stepping up to my text message the other night. <laughs> sure. Appreciate sure. it. And um, guys, like Allison said, we got we got more nitty gritty to get in. We see all of your questions. But, Guy, thank you for your time, and we appreciate you, and we'll be keeping in touch. Okay. Take care. Okay. See you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now to the woman of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, again, for those who are just joining or who, who weren't here in the very beginning, um, I know the traffic was probably really bad, so that's probably why you weren't able to get here on time. But I wanted to reintroduce... Lisa May, our government affairs director. Um, just so you know, all the rumors that you hear, Lisa probably heard them. She probably started them, actually. Um, so she, you know. I would she, never do that. She wants to stay employed. So, um, <laughs> but she is, she stays on top of all these things um, for us. That is, she is a staff member. Um, she serves a couple of other associations as well. But Lisa is always busy. She is always on calls with um, legislators. She is on calls with NAR, you know, National Association. She's always on calls with the state, other GADs, other, other government affairs directors. She's composing. I mean, the, the kinds of letters that she writes to some of these legislators is amazing. And she's always doing research and all that. So, um, Lisa, do you want to start off? I guess you're going to update us on a couple of the the uh, filed bills that have come out of our local delegation and um, mm -hmm. we'll go from there. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, it's good to see you, at least through the screen. Um, this has been a very interesting month, uh, very interesting month. Um, before the local tax bills kind of take our, uh, all the oxygen out of the rest of this call, um, I just, just want to note briefly um, that this is kind of a, a big day in terms of pandemic assistance programs for realtors and small businesses. Um, so many of you heard last night that the House signed off on the next round of um, stimulus. So that bill will recapitalize the economic uh, assistance loans and the paycheck protection loans. So you, we're hopeful that you know, as soon as today, you can begin um, applying for those. So for economic assistance, you go to the Small Business Administration website. Um, for paycheck protection, you're going to your regular lender. Um, also, state unemployment assistance for individuals, sole proprietors, independent contractors, not something that's typically been offered, and it took the state a while to get um, a system up and running to accept those types of applications and to get all of the information that you guys would do, say, verify your income. Um, that launched today. Um, I have heard that there's been a lot of hype traffic um, at the state unemployment website, um, and that some people are getting your messages. Yeah. Keep at it, because um, I am certain that every one first thing this morning who was going to apply all went and did it the same time. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was it was actually down this morning. The website was it? Okay, yeah. I was hearing error messages. Um, so let's be patient, but um, I believe it's uh, and I can post some links in the chat for everyone um, who's here, and, and we can include this as well. But um, if you go to the State Department of Labor, um, click on unemployment, they are putting together a portal for everyone, like a single portal to go through so that you can claim unemployment no matter what your employment status is. So that's what I have for state and federal. And Lisa, sorry, Lisa, real quick. Go ahead. Just to remind everyone, this call is recorded. Um, so don't feel like you have to take notes. It's going to be posted on HCAR's Facebook page and Lisa or someone will actually post the links 
on that feed so that you can easily get to that, okay? All right, sorry, go ahead. Thank you, and I'm just put, there we go. There's a link in our chat, but as Allison said, we'll post that later. Okay, so local bills, yay. Um, the County Council has been considering um, their capital and operating budgets um, this month. The capital budget was introduced April 1. The operating budget was introduced just this past Monday evening. In the capital budget, um, they were assuming a half percent increase in the transfer tax. Um, for those of you on the legislative committee or who um, were otherwise involved in lobby day or, or during the session, remember that there was enabling legislation that was introduced mm -hmm. to give the county council the authority to set their transfer tax rate. Um, so it didn't necessarily come as a surprise that they've been granted this authority. Um, they may look to use it. Um, a half a percent was a, a little on the high side and we shared information with them um, that, you know, that would put us in terms of out-of-pocket costs for a typical home sale um, at a dollar amount that would be the highest in the state. Um, we would, that is, you know, one and a half percent is the absolute highest rate that is charged in the state of Maryland. Um, but for instance, Baltimore City, who charges a one and a half percent transfer tax rate, has housing values that are a small fraction of ours, maybe a third of ours. Um, so even though they're charging that rate, their buyers are not having to save and to spend the same dollar level um, our county is. So, you know, we shared our concerns about a half a percent increase during the budget hearing. Um, also, just general economic uncertainty um, that's taking place right now. Do you really want to raise taxes when people are clearly um, looking for unemployment assistance and for business loans and, and things of that nature? So fast forward to Monday with the operating budget. Um, then came an announcement and um, HCAR was given a heads up by the sponsors of those bills that, hey, we're, we're gonna look to overhaul the recordation tax too. Um, I will um, share some links that, that get you to the exact um, uh, proposal, but essentially it would enact a tiered recordation tax structure. So under, for, for sales under $250,000, which looking online, I said, as I scrolled on through yesterday, there are about 40 properties on the market that are under $250,000 in Howard County. Um, and most of those are at, you know, 249, 245, something like that. Um, those properties would see a tenth of a percent decrease. So instead of um, instead of five dollars per thousand, that would go down to four uh, four dollars per thousand for those properties. However, every other tax bracket or every other home sale bracket would see an increase um, for properties between. Um, 250 to 499,000, um, the recordation tax would increase by half a percent. For properties between 500,000 and a million, the recordation tax would go up 1.1 percent. For properties over a million, it would go up 1.7 percent. Those are substantial. Those are substantial, not just in terms of how those rates compare to other jurisdictions, but in just dollar terms of what those mean to closing costs and, and everything else. Um, right now, I guess probably is the best time. I'm going to try to share my screen with all of you so that you can just kind of see um, 
what it, this looks like. And we've shared this with the county council members who introduced this, and we will continue to come up with um, other ways um, to share this. And we, um, it's Allison. Um, in addition to that, so where transfer tax really is about resale or transferring a property to somebody, um, somebody did submit a, a great question about recordation tax about people refinancing. Um, and that the recordation tax, I mean, as we know, over the last couple of months, refinances have gone through the roof, the point right. where some are actually pulling back on them. Um, and now there's concern because of people's, you know, income lowering that they're, they might be refinancing to get some cash out of their house. So they will be impacted by the, ref the recordation tax. And we just want to make that point because it doesn't just affect home sales. It affects every homeowner. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. To the extent that they are refinancing an amount higher than the original loan that they took out, that will be subject to this tax. Right. Um, I am going to share this screen with you all here. Is that working? Yes, we got it. Okay. So this was essentially what we shared with the council members because um, in their press release, and this is not something that is unique to this council or this administration or other groups, they tend to look at transfer and recordation taxes in isolation from one another. So when they talked about this transfer or recordation tax proposal, they said, well, we're lowering taxes on our most low in lowest income buyers and the lowest price home sale. But that's only true if you don't also have the transfer tax. And as you can see, if they go move forward with both of these bills, everyone gets a tax increase. Every single person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Lisa Whistle and I were talking yesterday about move up buyers, um, how this squeezes them because they're going to take less from their sale, pay more for their purchase. And, you know, somewhere in the middle, they have to try to get their their down payment and everything else from it. And then also new home sales. Um, because as we know, purchasers of a new home pay both sides of the transaction. And new home prices are, you know, are substantial here in Howard County. So when you see these upper, uh, upper limits, that's probably what a, you know, a new home buyer is going to be looking at tax increase wise. Um, so we will continue to share um, information uh, with the council. Um, we will, of course, be turning to all of you um, to reach out to them and um, to, uh, you know, we will have a call for action on this. Absolutely. Um, I know a number of people that, you know, had heard about this and were like, why aren't you like sending us out? Why can't we contact them now? Um, you know, I'm, I am all about sending people out with pitchforks on this proposal, but if you send people out with pitchforks and incorrect information, it's a really bad combination. It makes us look we, bad. Our, our message gets lost. We, so I wanted to make sure that these bills were in their final form before we send folks out. And right. I see you raising your hands. So I'm going to let her jump in. Lisa, for people that are not serving on our legislative committee, could you roll out just a uh, uh, paint the picture of the timeline? Because I think people don't understand that it, it was actually in a draft phase when they contacted us on, well, kind con of call me on Monday, Monday. or that evening. So if you can, because right. uh, I know everybody's, we're, we're ready to fight. <laughs> we're getting all our ducks in a row, but I want you just to paint the picture of how, how it works when someone drafts, the two sponsors drafted the um, piece of Sure. Okay. So the, um, the sponsor or sponsors or the administration, they work with the county's legal department and their, their staffs to come up with proposals and, and put them in the legislative format. Mm -hmm. For, um, they have a period that's called pre-filing. So for legislation that they want to consider in May, they 
pre-filed those bills 11 days before the start of the month. So last night was when these bills in their actual text form were posted as pre-filed. These bills will not be introduced until the first Monday of May. Um, and then they go through um, some work sessions. Um, the second Monday, the public hearing on this bill will be May 18th. That is also a Monday. And um, I will say that it, it may be several days of hearings, depending on how many people sign up. We've seen that with some legislation before. Um, that they had so many people signed up that they had to add an, another session and another session. Um, right now, um, they are meeting electronically as we are. Um, so if you are testifying, they will send you um, a WebEx for you to log in. They will let you know when it's your time to testify. Um, so all of these meetings are taking place remotely. So the day that we're marking on our calendars is May the 18th. And should they add other dates or things like that, we would certainly um, let all of you know as well. So just to clarify, so May the 18th is the hearing. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. And so I wanted to know when uh, the council would take a vote on this specific uh, bill. Typically that happens then in their um, first session of the month. So it would probably be the first Monday in June. Okay. And guys, just, just to clarify, unlike the state that the the county legislation goes through the entire year as you know as mm -hmm. needed um somebody asked what what the increases are the argument for the increases and what they're going towards and from my under from the understanding is that the transfer tax no matter what the increase is only 25 percent of what's collected can go towards schools correct that's correct so the easy one to look at is the recordation tax Recordation taxes go into the general fund. They are spent through the budget process. They are not earmarked for any particular thing. They just go to the general county operations. So that one's very straightforward. Um, the transfer tax gets a little more tricky um, just because it's set in state code and it has to be spent the way that state code outlines. So the current recordation tax is spent between, it's 25% to schools, 25% um, 20, to parks. Talking about transfer, right? Transfer, existing okay. transfer. Sorry about that, yes. So 25% to schools, 25% to parks. And these are capital projects. So we're talking school construction, not like teacher salaries or, or things right. of that nature, okay? Um, 25% goes to ag preservation. You have 12.5% that goes to fire and rescue. And then 12.5% that goes to housing programs. And if I, if I masked correctly, that equals 100%. Yeah, and to clarify too, there's a fire, you know, there is a fire tax as well that- Separately. We thought, yeah, that's separate from, from this divvy. Um, and not say that that obviously that's not important, but just to note that that was increased last year um, in the county. So this is, you know, right. Another increase. Right. And then so in the state en enabling legislation for this half percent increase, it also lays out how that has to be spent. Um, again, school capital construction gets 25% of it. Um, I don't believe there's any ag pres money in it. Um, but it is similarly divided up among um, different yeah. centers. And, and somebody asked who the sponsors were. Um, before I say who they are, it's public knowledge because it's on their yeah, website. Yes. But so right. we're not telling a secret here. Um, <laughs> the other thing is to note is that the the um, county executive, no matter who it's been started with, I think with Ken Allman, even maybe before that, they had a spending affordability committee, which we've always had a member serving on at least within the last couple of years. And just so everybody knows, the increase of transfer tax has always been a, a, named as a recommendation. This is not anything new. Um, so don't think that we've just been like, you know, relaxing here with my surfboards and stuff and have just let this go. It's always come up. This is one of the first years in a really long time where 
it's now gotten a little bit further. So I just want to note that this is not new and it's always been a suggested um, by, by the Spending Affordability Committee. I, realtors, when they served on it, were the only, you know, one vote. So, of no. Um, but Christiana Rigby and Opal Jones are the co-sponsors. That does of not- Of the recordation mean, tax. Of the recordation yeah, tax. Right. Yes. That does not mean that a majority of the county council is not in agreement or that they're not in favor. So these are just the two that have, have put it together and have taken, you know, the lead on it. So um, I guess, do you want to touch on a pre-filed bill that, that hit yesterday? Mm. Do I have to? Yes. <laughs> All right. well, yeah. and, before, and before we segue into it, uh, everybody knows that, you know, there was, a, there's no evictions allowed in the state of Maryland at this time uh, because of the pandemic that's going on. So this kind of segues into it, Lisa, if you want to talk about the uh, bill that was just pre-filed last night. Yeah, this was another one, um, and it came out of Montgomery County. Um, they actually just held a hearing on this bill yesterday afternoon um, on their version of this bill. Um, and uh, in speaking to um, the Greater Capital Area Association's GAD, he said, heads up, Howard and Anna Rundle have reached out um, on this bill as well. And I'm gonna put this link in here. But essentially, it is um, a bill which would enact a freeze on rent increases or other fee increases in rental properties during the duration of this emergency. And I'm going to put that link right in there so that folks can follow along with all the fun. Um, even before this bill came up, and I'm sure many of you no, if you, if you own a rental property, if you manage rental properties, um, that there has been a lot of assistance granted to renters, but the assistance that has been given to landlords has not kept pace. And um, this, this is essentially a, another example of that. Um, it's one thing to freeze fee increases on your tenants, but if your the fees that you have to pay as a landlord or as a, a you know, a, a property owner aren't similarly frozen, you're going to be put in a really tight spot. Um, and it, it's even compounded because these types of proposals apply from the largest, largest apartment complex down to the person who is renting their condo because they couldn't sell it for what they paid for it or, you know, something like that. Um, and so like most things, it's going to hit the small guy the hardest. And um, that's something that um, we're going to need to weigh in on. Um, at, uh, on a proposal like this, um, I'm sure the Maryland Multi-Housing Association um, and some of the other um, rental property associations will similarly be giving feedback. Um, but it's just a really, it's a really hard time right now, um, to be facing the economic uncertainty that we're seeing, to be facing tax increases, and to be limiting the means that people have to recoup, um, to recoup the costs and, and to remain financially viable right now. Um, so... That was my night last night, guys, was, was this. <laughs> and, um, instead of baseball, again. Instead of baseball. There was no baseball and there was no hockey. Wouldn't that kind of a bill also encourage landlords to get rid of their current tenants and bring another tenant in? Because they can, they can increase with, a, they can charge higher with a new tenant, right? It doesn't prevent them from that. I don't believe, yeah, it, for, in my reading, Susie, I think, you're, I think you're right. It doesn't prevent an expiring lease and, and someone to, you know, to-, to and, and so that could- that kind of under new terms. That, that could make it worse for people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's the, the owners, there's the someone to make that happen, but you could- oh, 
ultimately what they're trying to do could hurt the people they're trying to help. Right. And I think it's important to note that in, in terms of, um, you know, NAR's research, their economic pulse kind of surveys, most landlords are already attempting to work with their tenants. Yeah. Without having to have, you know, the legislation like stepping in and making them do it. Most already are. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's in their mutual interests to do so. Right. They have a tenant. I mean, it's hard, you know, if people are unemployed, then it might be harder to uh, find a, a tenant. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we actually no, talked about. Yeah, is that ahead. just residential or is that commercial leases too? You know, that's a good question. I haven't done a, a thorough read through um, again because it just came. I think it was just residential, but. Probably. I thought it was. I, I'm sure that they, you know, in terms of. That would be a really important people. Thing. Probably it's not commercial right now. They have their own issues. <sighs> um, anything on the state, Lisa, state level, national? Um, I know you were on a call with NAR yesterday. Um, I know they've been doing a ton of things to you know, help get some more funding for the payment protection plan and all that. Right. The, yeah, the biggest thing um, that they've been working on in this past week has been um, the, the payment protection plan and, and getting this next round of stimulus through. Um, you know, one thing that Guy noted is the difficulty that state and local governments are going to have. They can't print money like the federal government does. Um, so their means to deal with um, their losses of revenue are, are really limited. Um, Oh, it does have uh, rented commercial space. Thank you, Joseph Bird. Appreciate that. Um, one, so one thing that has not so far been included in the federal stimulus is assistance to state and local governments so that they can offset some of their losses. And um, unfortunately, um, we also haven't see a lot of assistance being given to nonprofits or not for profits. Um, so like or organizations or mm -hmm. other community associations have not been able to tap into the stimulus the same way that other types of um, business operations have been. So I think that those probably those two things um, are going to continue to be the focus going forward. Um, whether we need another round of stimulus, it, it does sort of depend on what Senator Gazzone said. Um, are, is this just a, a one and done? Do we have a recurrence where we have to do more social distancing at some point in the future? Um, you know, uh, I, I think that we're going to keep an eye on that at the federal level. Um, one other thing, um, just because this is also happening next week, is there's an election in Maryland, particularly here in Howard County for the seventh um, congressional, congressional district. Um, they are conducting that um, election largely by mail. So if you live in the seventh con congressional district, um, you should have received a ballot in the mail. Um, mm -hmm. If you um, have not already returned that, you want to get that postmarked by Monday, which is mm -hmm. the day. Um, if for some reason you did not receive your ballot in the mail or don't want to send your ballot back through the mail, there is a limited in-person voting um, opportunity um, at the county fairgrounds. So that will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. if you want to go vote in person but they are highly, highly <laughs> encouraging you to please vote by mail, um, just for your safety, for everyone's safety um, to do that. So um, we'll have a notice of that along with um, your sample ballot, all of that stuff in the HCARD newsletter. Um, I did wanna mention that um, the National Association of Realtors and RPAC, um, has, it has uh, endorsed uh, Kawisi Mpume in that race. Um, they did conduct candidate interviews, um, filled out candidate questionnaires, just like we do at HCAR and at the Maryland Realtors. 
Um, he uh, had 100% on that questionnaire. Um, he's been in public service for 40 years. Um, and so they feel um, very comfortable um, with how he would represent the industry in that race. Um, there will also be just, it's, it's, this might be the most confusing election I think <laughs> I've ever <laughs> been through. So this Monday is the special election to fill the remainder of the 2020 term. In June, then again in November, there will be another election for this seat to fill the term that starts in 2021. Right. So we will deal with that when it gets here, but for now, your, your marching orders are, by Monday, please return your ballot and please vote. If you're in the 7th District. Right. If you are in the 7th Congressional District. A lot of people are confused. Correct. Um, you can always go on to, you know, Google what district am I in, congressionally or statewide, and you can get your, and don't be embarrassed because, you know, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is don't forget to do your, your census. So the deadline mm -hmm. for the U.S. Census has been extended until, I think, August 15th. Right. Um, and who knows, it could be extended again. It literally takes two minutes. Um, you should have gotten something in the mail. If you don't, you can still do it online and they'll, you know, cross-reference you. It is really important because it determines how much funding a state and county are going to, going to get. It determines seats in, in Congress and everything like that. So it is important. Um, Lisa, anything else exciting um, going on? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, look, I know that... Um, I know that this will be incredibly, incredibly hard to top. Okay, but um, I, I have to, <laughs> I have to mention um, the NAR mid-year meetings. Um, those typically take place in Washington D.C. over like a four-day period in mid-May. Um, because of all of this, those are taking place online. So if you haven't been able to make it down to Washington, D.C. before, you can now do so from the comfort of your own home. Um, registration for that is supposed to open up this week. Um, I don't believe it was open as of last night. I haven't checked um, this morning. But they're spreading all of their governance meetings and speakers and committee meetings out over um, like a two, two and a half week period. Um, so there's an opportunity to attend even more than you would have um, if we were holding these um, in person. And then also, um, I just wanted to note, if you haven't been to HCAR's website or their Facebook page over the next two weeks, there is just a wealth of opportunity for you to learn. Um, there, there's a series that we're going to have mortgage lenders, title companies, movers. Um, we're going to have social media um education um so please go to hcar's website and sign up for those um you know i think all of us right now are just trying to get all of the information that we can hone our skills um and and you know get through this better and and stronger than than we were before yeah and for those who aren't following along in the chat um, Governor Hogan is speaking at three o'clock today to go over his road to recovery, um, which has four parts to it. So, which he touched on, I think it was it on Wednesday, maybe, yeah. or Tuesday. Right. Um, so I, I believe you, there have already been benchmarks set. You know, we have to hit a decline in cases and a decline mm -hmm. in all of this before we even consider opening up. And then we're expecting it to be a phased reopening. Um, they're not just going to one day say, okay, everything's back. Um, they're going to open up, you know, some of the lower risk um, businesses first, um, probably your giant sports gatherings, you know, what I'm interested in um, will be last. Um, but I think, you know, we were all, we were all talking, you guys, in terms of social distancing, in terms of masks, disinfectant, you know, you guys are going to be like the experts on how to handle a reopening because a lot of members of the public are probably going to be asked to do many of the things that you guys are doing um, in your businesses right now. Um, so it's, it's, it could be a longer road than maybe we had first hoped, but um, our interest is, of course, in keeping everyone safe. 
Um, real quick, uh, before we touch on a, an initiative by HCAR Cares uh, Foundation, Jessica, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot. Um, you had been in conversation, or you'd been reaching out to anybody that does business in, in Howard County, specifically Columbia, you may have experienced that, you know, with the compliance letter request that some of the villages are, are closed and are not doing inspections. Um, right. Members are aware of that. Jessica, our CEO, has been in conversations with PA or has reached out to them to, to figure out what's going on. Yeah, so let me give an update because actually I'm still waiting on a resolution. Um, so a few of you that are on this call are very familiar with it. But I got some calls last week from some members and managers. And basically, um, some of the villages uh, have their compliance officers still working and responding to agents um, needing a compliance letter um, to clear the, the, the seller. However, I had to basically, we had to, you know, send a formal letter to the Columbia Association just asking for a... Um, a, a response on every village um, because as of now there are some villages more than others who are not responding to anything emails calls um, and we do understand that they just furloughed a lot of people uh, we do understand that they have a little chaos going on in their administration however um, we you know we are part of the essential working group and a lot of our realtors have um, pending transactions. Um, so I have got a response from um, Mr. Milton, the executive director, and he acknowledged our concerns and he promised that he'll be getting back with us immediately. Um, I got a, a little insight from a birdie on this call that um, our letter was heard and has uh, basically put a fire under them um, to formally respond and give us some information. Because my standpoint is I have to inform you guys of what's going on. Um, we can't have Wild Lake Village working and functioning and then we have uh, enough, two or three um, villages non-responsive. <laughs> so that's, that's where we are right now. So I have no good news really until they give us an update on every single village and, and basically, you know, tell us exactly what, what, what is their COVID plan? You know, what, what are they doing in response to this crisis? Um, because we simply need compliance officers, even if one compliance officer that is still working could cover all the villages um, at this time. But that's really all right now, but I'm gonna keep you all informed and probably send something out formally to everybody once I get the response from the Columbia Association, so. Thank you, Jessica. Just wanted to uh, note that. Um, and then we have one last thing. Um, uh, well, yes. So, yeah, it depends. I can tell you for a fact that Wild Lake and Oakland Mills are not doing um, compliance requests. So, um, yes, Joe, makes complete sense. But, you know, as we know in this world, some people don't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, Susie. So, yeah. anyway, we're working on it for you. I mean, I, I personally had a transaction where we just held an escrow back with the title company right. until we can verify that, you know, the house is painted correctly and, and all mm -hmm. that. Um, so, Susie, did you have a comment? The problem with them trying to get combined is that what's okay in River Hill isn't okay in Long Reach, isn't okay in Wild Lake. And what they did was they called a, Milton called a meeting of all the village managers and compliant covenant advisors. I think it was Wednesday, but we don't have the results of that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just wanted to just let everybody know that while it seems like something so little and you might not, you know, it's going to pop up probably for you in a transaction and just wanted to let you know that each car is working on it. Um, one last thing is that our, our charitable foundation, H car cares is working on an initiative to send letters, notes, drawings to senior living facilities. Um, that information can be found on our website, hcarcares.org. Not hcar, but hcarcares. It's on uh, hcar too. Okay, it's on yeah. hcar too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, also it's on our Facebook page and it's been shared. And um, and I already received a note yesterday that somebody's sending a bunch of letters in. All you have to do is go to the mailbox and send it directly to hcar. 
and we will take care of everything else for you. Yeah, we, we have, just to chime in on that, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great initiative. I'm so proud of HCAR Cares Board of Directors for this idea. But honestly, guys, anybody can participate. I have a group of realtors in Alabama that want to jump on our bandwagon and send letters from Alabama. We have partnered, and I think our president, um, Donna Weaver, is on here. We have partnered with, I think we're up to like seven facilities and people are still reaching out saying, hey, I saw this on somebody's Facebook page. Can I get you in contact with this facility that's in Howard County? I'm like, yeah, please. Um, so your kids, your church group, um, your spouse, whomever, we're just sending you know, notes of hope, um, notes of cheer. Because remember guys, a lot of our seniors are um, not receiving any visitors from their family. Um, and then we're, we're also going to tap into the seniors that never get, vi nev never have visitors anyway. Um, so it's easy, it's thoughtful, and it's something you can do from the safety of your home. So please drop a note in the mail today. Um, we're going to, we're going to get it distributed. Sarah, you want to say something? I just wanted to add, we're also doing, if you uh, post a picture of your submission on Facebook and use the hashtag HCARCARESSENIORS, you'll be entered to win a $100 gift card to a local restaurant. So make sure that you're posting those pictures as well. And Sarah comes to us from the, the Eastern Shore now. She is Vice President of Operations, correct? Um, and she's also our, she's the liaison for HCAR Cares organization. So excited to have Sarah. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Um, just keep, you know, keep your, I know you like to delete our emails. Um, but, but make sure, make sure you're during a time like this. I mean, uh, so make sure you're opening our emails, check HCAR's page every day, check mm -hmm. HCAR Cares. Um, there's, a, there's a whole COVID resource page for you on there as well. Um, also ver visit Maryland Realtors um, website every now, you know. Now's the time, you have nothing else to do, uh, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of resources. I do have to say outside of HCAR, because I think we've always been on top of things, the state and the national association have really stepped up to help its members through all of this um between webinars resources i know nar is doing some tele tele mental health type of uh, stuff too two for, free months for all members for, mm -hmm. for all members telehealth yeah so go to those websites just google at you know national association of realtors go to those websites and find out what resources are available um you know, uh, we have them throughout the year, but now is really the time to check out. Um, I, I don't know about the Maryland Facebook Live meeting, Anita. Um, I would just go to their website and see. I know they, ha they had one yesterday, I believe. Fair housing. Fair housing. Yeah, fair mm -hmm. housing. So there's, just, just go to those pages every single morning and just find out, you know, what's going on. It's, it's hard to keep on top of everything and a lot of them are recorded so you can always go back if you miss a facebook live you can go rewatch it this will be this has been recorded um yeah you can do some online designations and um uh c2x there's yep an air dot realtor coronavirus mm -hmm. um, i i have to i have an interesting fact to leave with you guys um h card just got a florida realtors the state yeah, so florida realtors they got a call from Florida Realtors. Uh huh. And they want to copy our uh, Senior Smile Initiative. What? I oh, sure. The beaches. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They ca they called us this morning. Danielle took the call, um, and we sent them to Sarah. So Sarah will be handling helping them set up their um, awesome Smile Initiative for the state of Florida. That's that's. Great. That's great. I haven't heard from them yet, but I look forward to it. I think Danielle just emailed you the contact from the state okay. office that called. That says a lot about what we're doing. I'm sorry, guys. I, I was uh, tied up with another meeting and joined late, but good to see you guys. Good morning. I also just wanted to mention, um, uh, Allison, you plugged a lot of NAR's great um, initiatives, but also don't um, 
forget about the EPRO and PSA designation classes that are being offered for free right now. The mm -hmm. class itself is free and then the designation is half off. So you can get the EPRO designation for only $75. So you can find those through NAR's website as well. What was the second one, Lisa? Uh, PSA. That's and then several others as well that are uh, available. So just bookmark all three, all four websites, HCAR Cares, HCAR.org, Maryland Realtors, and mm -hmm. National Association. And there's stuff on there every single day that they're updating. Um, so yeah, I think and we're, go ahead. And we're trying to centralize everything. Um, I, I think we're doing a good job, but well, we're going to continue to add because because you all know things are ever evolving and ever changing. So HCAR um, on our website and on Facebook, we have been uh, promoting our resource page. And really, we're just trying to gather everything because we know that there's a lot of information. We know that that could be a little stressful. Um, so we're trying to be that one-stop shop for you guys. Um, if you see anything that you think we need to add to it, you know, email us at our staff email. That's staff um, at hcar.org. And we're going to be on top of it because we're, we're, you know, guys, we're still working for you all. Um, and just thank you all for this, for coming on this call and having a cup of coffee or tea with us. Um, I think this was successful. Um, thank you to our host and to our government affairs Director, I can't say enough. Um, she is working on our behalf while you're sleeping. Uh, she is doing things for us um, beyond um, what you think. Um, so kudos to the May and the whole legislative committee. Um, I have been very, very much impressed with the dedication and the work and the time that you all give um, to HCAR um, and, and our community as well, because a lot of things that we fight for affects our consumers um, and our community partners too. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you everybody for joining us on this call and uh, check us out on Facebook. All right. Thanks, Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. Stay safe. Bye.